One of the most defining factors of American society is our sense of individualism. If you ask a random person on the street to describe themselves, they'll often say something like, I'm blonde, or I am smart, or I am loyal, rather than by their relationship to others. Individualistic cultures value self-reliance, independence, and assertiveness, while collectivist cultures value prioritizing the group over the individual and cohesiveness is valued. One can argue for either collectivism or individualism as being a better ideology, as there are pros and cons for each. However, in America, the faults of individualism are becoming apparent through the internet and emerging internet culture. As we value individualism, so too has hyper-individualism risen in prominence. Hyper-individualism is the distilled version wherein people tend to act in a highly individual way without regard to society or their place within it. As reality and the online world merge, so too did this culture with the mainstream, most prominently in the form of identity politics. In the past 10 years, the use of the word non-binary has risen as more and more people have begun to identify outside of the common gender binary. This coincides with the rise of postmodernism, which is characterized by self-referentiality, epistemological relativism, moral relativism, pluralism, irony, irrelevance, and eclecticism. It rejects the universal validity of binary oppositions, stable identity, hierarchy, and categorization. This movement was headlined by writers such as Judith Butler, who claimed that gender and sex were interchangeable and only social constructs, and preceded by works as far back as 1988, such as Anne Fausto Sterling's paper, The Five Sexes, which argued that there are actually five sexes, male, female, merm, firm, and herm. It is on the back of this movement and these claims that non-binary has gained momentum and validation. Postmodernism rejects the necessity of facts and reason, and instead thrives in a general suspicion of reason, and an acute sensitivity to the role of ideology in asserting and maintaining political and economic power. By claiming that there are more than two sexes and therefore two genders, postmodernism validates the concept of stepping free of gender roles by entering a new one. However, no matter how long academics philosophize over it, there are only two types of gametes, two sexes, and two genders, as while gender is socially constructed, it refers to the treatment one receives because of sex. The largest misunderstanding is the belief that one can interchange sex, sexuality, and gender. They are not interchangeable concepts. In simplified terms, sex is about physical characteristics, sexuality is about sexual orientation, that is, emotional, physical, and or romantical attraction, while gender is about attitudes, feelings, and behaviors given in a certain socio-cultural context. Often, non-binary individuals identify as such because they feel different from the gender roles ascribed to them. Instead of simply being gender non-conforming, they instead choose to opt out of the identity, hoping that that might free them from their discomfort. One non-binary individual stated, I'm neurodivergent, autistic to be exact, and I have trouble picking up on social cues. Since gender is, in this day and age, mostly a social construct, I never fully picked up on it. I can see it now, but it's harder to just shove myself into it after years of not understanding. Some people have said it's just taking the easy way out, and if it's hard to understand, why try when you don't have to? For me, it feels different. While I truly did not understand what gender was then, I do understand now. I just choose not to associate myself with the construct that I feel I don't belong in. This is a common narrative wherein a person does not feel like they fit the common ideal or standard of their born sex, and rather than transition to the opposite sex in order to deal with these feelings, they instead choose to exist outside of it entirely. In this sense, choosing to identify as non-binary feels more like a rejection of societal standards rather than a separate gender as a whole. Given that so many non-binary individuals are female, I believe that many are simply disconnected from their womanhood under the patriarchy and are unable to match up who they are as a person with the unattainable standards that society holds for us. If it were merely a fad, no different from any other fast fashion scheme which pleases out every season or so, then perhaps one could overlook hyper-individualism as being a fault of the youth. But the proliferation of the non-binary identity does cause irreparable harm as it destroys any chance of forming a collective and attempting to solve the issues at the root of the problem. Being non-binary is an individualistic cope response to sex-based oppression, or to being part of an oppressor class based on your sex. It doesn't materially improve anyone's conditions of living, doesn't address or challenge sexist stereotypes or gendered expectations, and doesn't provide a solid foundation for an identity independent of the binary. After all, it's still right there in the name, creating a new binary. It's merely a cheap way to pretend one can opt out of oppression on an individual level. It also implies that other women are somehow lesser or less unique. When you say that you're not a woman despite being female, what are you saying about what women are? What are you saying about what women deserve? 
How can you identify womanhood with oppression and instead of helping to liberate us all from it, instead choose to hide behind binders and haircuts and pretend people can't see you and that they won't treat you exactly the same? The concept of multiple genders and sexualities has expanded beyond just female, male, and non-binary. Hyperspecific sexualities and genders are not as popular or mainstream as non-binary is, but they are quickly gaining momentum and have been around on platforms like Tumblr and TikTok for quite a while. They are more commonly known as MOGAI, which is an acronym standing for Marginalized Orientations and Gender Alignments or Identities and Intersex. On the LGBTA wiki, over 678 sexualities are listed. This is in stark comparison to the traditionalist view of only five sexualities lesbian, gay, straight, bisexual, and asexuality, some of which can be attributed to an overlap. Both sapphic and lesbian are listed, and there are plenty of others which overlap due to small differences, such as being exclusionary or inclusionary of non-binary and other non-traditional genders. Many of these terms are only used by a few people, and only requires one person's recognition to be considered valid. Of course, in an individualistic culture like the United States, who needs the validation of their society to uphold a personal truth? No matter how much one person may identify as and hold something up as truthful, it doesn't mean that their society itself gives it meaning. For example, Karnik is the Xeric orientation that is attracted to xenogender loving xenogender exclusively. It was invented on July 12th of 2021. Xenogender is an umbrella term for non-binary gender identities that cannot be fully described through their relation to concepts typically used to describe gender, such as masculinity, femininity, androgyny, neutrality, agenitry, or other entity. Instead, xenogenders can best be described through how they relate to things, beings, or concepts that most people don't think of as having to do with gender, such as animals, plants, things, or concepts. If only one person defines and believes in this being a real sexuality, is it a valid one? If it only applies to a single person, is this still a descriptor worthy of being noted? If society doesn't have the context for it, does it mean anything at all? When we argue philosophy over policy, it's so much harder to come to a common agreement. You can spend years arguing about what makes a chair a chair, but if your boss asks you to buy a chair and you come back with the couch, you'll both know you made a mistake. But how do you argue something as basic as definition with someone determined to ignore reality for the sake of political ideology? If you hold up a pear and insist it's an apple, and still insist that the dictionary definition of apple is incorrect, how do we advance in our discussion? If I relent and agree to pretend the pear is an apple, how do we discuss the differences between the two? If I hold fast, then you've stymied the discussion. We cannot make decisions or share opinions if we each believe the same word has two different meanings. You've created a language barrier within a single language, defeated the very purpose of words and blocked communication before it even began. This can be further seen in neo-pronouns, which are any set of singular third-person pronouns that are not officially recognized in the language they are used in, typically created with the intent of being a gender-neutral pronoun set. For example, instead of being referred to as he-him, a person might choose to be referred to as z zer or even something like z per denoting a noun gender. Without even going into the newer phenomena of system identities and the like, a simple question arises. Why is there a rise of hyperspecific descriptors centered around one's identity? The answer is also pretty simple. We want to feel special. The internet, as always, has always had a large impact on this phenomenon. Prior to its widespread use, the closest one could get to the social climate of the internet would be through pen pals, wherein you formed an image of them through your interactions and perhaps through a photo or two if they sent them. For Generation Z and many millennials who have grown up with the internet, online forums have created an avenue for conceptual relationships to form. Instead of falling in love with or becoming friends with the person in your life, one who you come across in the flesh, people are making deep connections based on intangible aspects of a person. You talk about television shows or comment on the same forums, and often these relationships are formed without knowing how the other looks, and are based on a very specific part of themselves, the one they seem to share. When you're used to viewing people as concepts instead of fully realized individuals, how can you view yourself as anything else? When you feel alone and different from the stereotypes and ideals sold to you by the media, why shouldn't you latch into the parts of yourself that feel the most individual? Additionally, with so much of ourselves up for view on the internet, so many experiences that we think are solely our own end up being widespread and common. And no one likes to feel common. The fragility of these identities illustrates just how little sense they make in an effort to make individuals feel more unique than they really are. 
If you choose not to play along with gender identities, you will often get charged with invalidating people's gender. This accusation should cause concern, as a healthy identity should not be able to be invalidated by non-participation. For example, I am a motorcyclist. It is a part of my identity because I ride a motorcycle. If someone tells me that I'm not a real rider, that I don't look like a rider, or refuses to call me a biker, none of that changes the fact that I have a motorcycle sitting in my garage and that I ride it every day after work. I do that. So someone else denying that I'm a motorcyclist changes nothing about the fact that I am one by virtue of the fact that I drive a motorcycle. Let's say I did not drive a motorcycle, but I wore a motorcycle jacket and carried around a helmet. Someone might mistake me for a biker, but that doesn't suddenly translate into driving ability. I could insist people refer to me as a biker, but unless I actually ride, it makes no difference. Gender is the same premise. I am female, and that's why I'm a woman. Getting called he or sir doesn't change that. Dressing in masculine clothing doesn't change that. And transitioning doesn't change that either. Someone can deny that I am a woman, but I know I am because I'm female. I don't identify as I am. A male person can dress like a woman and look the part. He can even insist people refer to him as she or woman or even female, but he never will be because he is male. The same goes for being non-binary or any other gender identity. When you are accused of invalidating gender, they're really telling on themselves. If your identity can be denied and that actually affects it, it's not real. It's constructed. It's a fantasy that's been miscast as an identity. It's unhealthy to organize your life around an identity that isn't rooted in reality. It's unhealthy to organize your life around an identity, period. Your identity dictating your life is not healthy. Life dictating your identity is healthy. All in all, the rise of postmodernism and liberalism have created the perfect storm to allow for hyper-individualism to flourish. And of course, we must always ask, who benefits from us being unable to realize what we hold in common? Who benefits most from a culture where we focus on what divides us instead of what unites us? I'd like to end this video with a quote about liberalism from Catherine McKinnon and liberalism and the death of feminism. What is the difference between the women's movement we had and the one we have now, if it can be called a movement? I think the difference is liberalism. Where feminism is collective, liberalism is individualistic. We have been reduced to that. Where feminism is socially based and critical, liberalism is naturalistic, attributing the product of women's oppression to women's natural sexuality, making it ours. Where feminism criticizes the ways in which women have been sexually determined in an attempt to change that determination, liberalism is voluntaristic, meaning it acts like we have choices that we do not have. Where feminism is based on material reality, liberalism is based on some ideal realm in the head. And where feminism is relentlessly political about power and powerlessness, the best that can be mustered by this nouveau movement is a watered-down form of moralism. This is good, this is bad, no analysis of power or powerlessness at all. In other words, members of groups, like women, who have no choice but to live life as members of groups are taken as if they are unique individuals. Their social characteristics are then reduced to natural characteristics. Preclusion of choices becomes expression of free will. Material reality is turned into ideas about reality, and concrete positions of power and powerlessness are transformed into mere relative value judgments about which reasonable people can form different but equally valid preferences. Women's experiences of abuse becomes a point of view. This, dear viewers, is where we part. You might find this video to be familiar, and that's because I did rework a script from an earlier video. That was one where I was speaking into the camera, no visuals, etc. And I did feel like I could update the script because I have grown in writing scripts since last year. I definitely feel like I have a better understanding of how to organize ideas and how to incorporate quotes and whatnot while talking into a microphone. So hopefully this updated version makes sense and you guys enjoy it. Let me know if you have any comments, concerns, questions in the comments down below. Don't forget to like, follow, subscribe, etc. And I'll see you guys next time. Bye!